Welcome to Lake Washington School District's uh, Career Panel Series. My name is Rose Wu and I am the College and Career Specialist at Redmond High. Uh, we are privileged today to take a look at careers in law and politics with professionals who work at the City of Redmond, um, Watson Immigration Law and Politics, and uh, King County Government. So, in this session, you will hear about their education and career pathways and advice that they have for you as high school students who are exploring careers in law and politics. Our session today is being recorded and will be posted on our website so students can access at a later time. And uh, so what I will do is I'll be asking our panelists some questions and then we will open the floor for you all to ask questions as well. All right. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Mayor Angela Burney. She's the City of Redmond Mayor. Mayor, uh, Mayor Burney was elected in 2019, and she is the executive leader who develops the vision and implements the strategies for Redmond. She oversees eight departments and over 700 employees. Uh, she collaborates with council to set policies for the City of Redmond, and she was elected this, to City Council in 2015 and served as council president from 2018 to 2019. Prior to her council service, she was the chair of the Redmond Parks and Trails Commission and volunteered at several different organizations throughout the Redmond community. Mayor Bernie is a Washington native and grew up in Eastern Washington. She moved to Redmond in 1998 and, lived on, and, and lives on Education Hill with her husband and daughters. And next we have Ms. Tamina Watson. She's the immigration lawyer and founder at Watson Immigration Law. Ms. Watson relocated to the U.S. from England in 2005. She is admitted to practice law in Washington State and in the state of New York. She is also admitted to the Federal Court of Western District of Washington. Ms. Watson is passionate about immigration law. She is a frequent speaker, blogger, author, and the host of two podcasts, <laughs> Tamina Talks Immigration and the Startup a visa podcast. She is fluent in Bengali and knows conversational Hindu and Urdu. Um, and in her spare time, Ms. Watson likes to write, sketch, volunteer in the community, listen to audiobooks and podcasts, and spend time with her family. And lastly, we have Judge Michelle Gilson. She is a King County District Judge. Judge Gilson was unanimously appointed to King County District Court uh, bench by the King County Council in 2019. She is currently assigned to Redmond Courthouse where she presides over a variety of criminal and civil matters. She is committed to ensuring that everyone who enters the courtroom feels heard, respected, and experiences the legal process in a, fair, in a truly fair and equitable way. Uh, Judge Gilson has a deep commitment to judicial involvement in the community, and she founded the Bothell Youth Court. Uh, she also volunteers and teaches civics in middle and high school classrooms. So her community involvement has earned her numerous awards, including the Washington Women Lawyers Vanguard Award and the Flame of Democracy Award and uh, the Washington Judges Foundation Nevins Award. Judge Gilson has lived on the east side for the past 20 years. Her husband is a me uh, mechanical engineer at the Boeing Company, and her son attends public school in the North Shore School District. In her off time, Judge Gelson enjoys hiking with the family dog, Roxy. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, I'd like to just start out by asking our panelists some questions. The first question is, um, let's see here, make sure. Uh, since most of our audience are high school students, we're wondering, what did you do after high school? Uh, if you continue in your education, please tell us where you went, where you attended college, and what was your major? And we can start with Judge Nelson first. All right, uh, so thank you. So I actually went to high school in Arizona. I went to a public high school, uh, Nogales High School. It was on the Mexican-American border. Uh, and then I went to college actually in Texas. And I went uh, for my undergraduate degree at Texas State University. Uh, and I, then I went to law school at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And then I met my husband, who was a Boeing engineer, as you kind of heard in the bio, and that's how I got to Seattle. So I, 
that's uh, that's my I guess my my college path. It takes seven years uh, to become uh, a lawyer and um, my major was political science and my minor uh, was history and uh, with a political science major I would say it's probably good to go to law school <laughs> with that. Uh, but you can just, uh, as a side note, uh, if you do want to go to law school, you can have any undergrad that you want. You don't have to do poli-sci or pre-law uh, if you want to do mechanical engineering or if, uh, anything. And I'm curious to see what um, uh, our other panelist, uh, what her um, BA was in or BS. So I'll pass it to you. Yeah, it's a very different pathway. And actually, when I became a lawyer here, it was very difficult to figure out how to be a lawyer in the United States. So I was born and raised in London, um, and my sister's here. She's visiting. <laughs> I'm glad she was able to catch this. She leaves, leaves tomorrow. Um, but we lived in Bangladesh for a good 10 years. I was born 0 to 8 in London, 8 to 18 in Bangladesh, 18 back to London, and then at 30, I moved to the US. Um, my formative years, my high school years, were in um, in Bangladesh, but I came back to London where I had to go to high school a little bit for a little bit longer because of the transition. But I went to a university called Brunel University, which is close to Heathrow Airport in London. And in London, you can actually in the UK you can do an undergraduate degree in law. Mm. And I always wanted to be a lawyer. Every ever since I can you know remember, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I became I did a law degree. But what's different about the education system between the United Kingdom and the U.S. is that you can go to law school straight from your undergraduate degree. Um, but the law school education is different from how it is here. The law school education that you will have in the US is similar to what you would have in, at the undergraduate level in the UK. Law school in the US is teaching you, in the UK is teaching you the practical skills hmm. of being a lawyer. So you would have moot um, training, um, you know, negotiation <coughs> training, uh, all the things that you need to know to learn to practice as a lawyer, you would learn that at law school. So all the civil codes and the criminal codes, um, you know, at the time it didn't make a lot of sense, but our, our you know, exams were about all of that, as opposed to the torts and everything else you learn at law school. You know, we did that at undergraduate level. Now, in the UK, you can actually have a non-law degree and get to law school, but you do something transitionary, which is sort of like a diploma, a law diploma, where it's a condensed version of what you do at law school, so you can go and become a lawyer. Um, with that undergraduate law degree, people in the U if you come to the US or if you want to have some qualification in the US, so long as you have a law degree from the UK, you can actually take the bar exams in New York and California. And so as life would have it, I moved to the US because I met the man of my dreams <laughs> in a sleepless in Seattle moment <laughs> in Seattle while I was visiting. And uh, at the time, it wasn't a question, I, I will go where my heart goes, but I didn't really consider that it would be very difficult for me mm. to become a lawyer again. Every time I'd call Whisper, they'd say, hmm, I think you need to go back to law school. I said, I've had so much schooling, it's not <laughs> happening. But I knew I could take the bar exams for New York, and that's what I did. Um, and so with a New York bar exam, I, I could practice federal, uh, federal law anywhere in the country. And immigration, as it happens, was a thing I didn't want to do. Of all the lists of law that there was, you know, there, I didn't want to do immigration. But life has a funny way of following you. And I eventually succumbed to it for two reasons. Number one, even though it was like three months where I had my green card because I had to go through the immigration process myself. Uh, anybody who's coming to the United States as a visitor or a worker or somebody who's going to live here has to go through a very rigorous process. And I had just gone through it, not realizing the future was going to lie there for me. Um, but that's how I, when I couldn't find a job, it took three months, I was impatient. In hindsight, it wasn't a long time. I should have enjoyed myself. <laughs> um, I fell into immigration law because my immigration lawyer needed some help. But I had already rejected three jobs in immigration because I didn't really want to do it. Um, and so that's the beginning of the journey that I've had. And I have not looked back. Immigration law is everything I wanted to practice without knowing that was the thing I wanted to do. Great. Um, well, 
Hello, it's absolutely wonderful to be here. My daughters went to school here. I sat in this room uh, about four years ago when oh. my daughter was graduating from high school and going to going to school back east. And I don't think her banners up here. I don't know where. Must change them out every year. Um, so she's graduating from college this year, which is fantastic. So um, thank you all for taking this time. I know that it's a Wednesday. You could be doing a lot of other things or maybe homework or something. Um, so thanks for hanging out with us. So I'm Angela Bernie, I'm the mayor of Redmond. Um, I have a very unusual path. Um, oh, I thought it was an unusual path, but the more elected officials I meet, the more I realize that it's a completely varied path and there's no one straight trajectory for getting there. So um, I grew up in Eastern Washington. I when I went to my first years of college at University of Washington, and then I transferred to Eastern Washington University and finished there with a BA in biology and chemistry and ended up teaching middle school for some time over in Eastern Washington. and. Um, so that was my undergrad degree, and when I was a teacher, they required you to get a master's, so I got a master's in professional development. And then my life took a turn to, this is a strange story, <laughs> um, also took a turn where I moved over to this side of the state um, and married my husband <laughs> for 25 years now. <laughs> we, were, we were friends in high school though, so it's a little different. But um, anyway, so we've been here for 25 years now, and um, at that time I stayed at home with my kids, and I will tell you, I um, get bored easily. and so love my daughters, they're fantastic, and also I ended up volunteering a lot in all kinds of different places. So I volunteered with Rockwell Elementary, I volunteered with, I was on the PTA, I volunteered with Lake Washington Schools Foundation, they worked on some science grants that I helped with that. Um, if you ever took robotics in, this, in the district, we helped start some of those programs. Um, and then I was asked by a friend to be on the Parks and Trails Commission, applied for that. Um, ended up being the chair of that. Someone asked me, hey, have you ever thought about running for city council? And I was like, no, not really. <laughs> what, what does that entail? And um, just so I have a very unusual path to where I got um, to this point of being mayor. So the, the interesting thing is, um, and I will just, I'll probably say this multiple times, it kind of, um, your path can have a lot of twists and turns you never quite know. Some of you may have decided, like, I'm going to be a lawyer. And some of you may have think, I'm not really certain what I would like to do, but I have a lot of different interests. And I would say, explore those interests. I, even in my job as mayor of a city of Redmond, which is 77,000 people, I, I manage about 800 staff members, um, you know, make sure that the city works. A lot of the work that we do actually goes back to my roots in biology and chemistry. We do a lot of water. You have to have safe drinking water. Um, we manage the way the waters go throughout, you know, when you flush the toilet where it goes. <laughs> to make sure that works. We work on a lot of um, environmental sustainability things, which are um, part of my background. So you kind of never know what skills you're going to bring to the job, um, but it's really important to explore the things that really give you passion and give you uh, purpose for what you do. Thank you. Yeah. That's very true. <laughs> That's one of the first things we tell students, too, is really um, explore what interests you and not just look at what the how much the job pays for. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so my next question will be for Judge Gilson. Um, did you know what you were that you were going to be doing this job when you were our student's age? No, I, I did not know I would be a judge, but I always wanted to be a lawyer when I did, uh, we had like mock trial, you know, in middle school. Mm -hmm. And I was hooked from, from then on that I wanted to be a trial attorney. I never in a million years imagined that I'd be a judge. And it's kind of just just as the mayor was talking about how life takes twists and turns. Mm -hmm. I had my son, and you can't be a trial attorney because uh, they don't do you know part-time <laughs> trials. <laughs> uh, so it just I, it was um, the opportunity I became open in Bothell for a part-time judge. And, and so I, that's where it led me to the judicial path. I, so that's how I, I became uh, a judge. So no, at your age, I did not. But I did know I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, like I said, I, my son is a junior in high school. And he, is, uh, he doesn't know exactly what he wants to do when he uh, grows up, I guess you'll say. And, but he does have a lot of interest, just like the, the mayor is saying. And I think that it's, uh, and he's trying all kinds of different things to, to see what he will like. And that is the best thing to do, is just explore, right? Find out your options. Mm -hmm. There's a lot out there. OK, next, um, Ms. Watson. I think you actually did touch on this. How did you decide on becoming an immigration lawyer? So I'm going to, um, let's see here, 
I like to ask you, what do, what do you like best about your job? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I love that I'm touching lives in a very deep way. Um, I didn't realize this until last year because I was training a lot of lawyers to do pro bono work. And I kept saying, you've got to do this work because you're going to change lives for generations to come. And I thought, wait, I've been doing that for 12 years or however many years. And that's what happens in immigration. Um, immigration law is about either uniting people with their loved ones or helping people start their businesses here or having businesses get talent to operate those businesses. And this ultimately boils down to helping American consumers, American economy, and it really helps everybody come together. So I love that I can see the result of my work in a, I would say a relatively short time, even though nothing is short in immigration, but I'm not paper pushing to have a result that I could not see. And, you know, I, my husband says this, that, you know, he never gets invited to weddings, but I do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, I do love that my clients have become friends because when you're in such an emotionally charged situation, you can't help but, you know, fall in love with the people that you're working with because you're seeing the, the trauma that they're going through, the frustrations that they're going through, and don't even get me started with COVID and what that did to it, even, you know, that came at, on, on the heels of what the Trump administration did. So I love that I am needed. I have a skill that is actually uh, useful on a very uh, visible way on a, on a very daily basis. And, you know, just as the Afghan situation was erupting, Ukrainian situation was, was, was erupting, I'm able to use the law to make a difference in people's lives, especially during crises. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next question for Mayor Bernie. Yeah. Uh, what skills or talents do you need to do your job well? <laughs> <laughs> um, many oh, skills and talents. Uh, uh, so many, so many things. Um, so uh, I would say um, having. Um, uh, so I used to teach middle school because I loved that you could never, you never knew what a day was going to hold. For you. <laughs> I get, I get bored easily. Um, so this is a job where you have to make sure that you are fine with things changing on sometime an sometimes an hourly basis, sometimes a daily basis. You never really know what your day is going to hold for you, mm -hmm. and you have to kind of embrace that um, excitement of what that looks like. Um, the other, um, another skill that's really good to have if you're uh, thinking about you want to go into an elected office um, is that you have to build, be uh, willing to build relationships with people that you may or may not um, want to be friends with outside of that. So you have to figure out a path forward to think about, um, I, you and I maybe don't have the same viewpoint on these things, but I think I need to invest in the time to get to know you a little bit, build those relationships, and find a path forward that takes into account your thoughts and beliefs and concerns, and mine and others, and try to find a better path forward. Um, I would say that generally stubbornness is not a great trait for an elected official because um, there's so much you can learn from other people and their ideas and their experiences. It's really important to bring those in to the decisions that you make um, in, in the job that you have. So those are some of the skills. There's, there's a lot. I, you know, I, I, I do use a lot of my skills that I learned in my teaching degree and my science degree, and I've also done leadership, um, leadership east side, graduated of that in 2017, so continuing to develop my leadership skills and working with people, um, and always thinking about ways that I can develop more as a person, so I can represent all of you and your families and everyone else in Redmond and, and, and the region and the other jobs, the other work that I do, um, and make sure I'm always looking out for the greater good and everything that I do. So similar to both, both of you, mm -hmm. um, you're, we're always looking for ways that we're making decisions and making impact in our greater society and for the positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question is for Judge Gilson. Uh, what is the most satisfying part about your job? I think when you, well, it's a hard question because as you know, most people don't want to be in a courtroom <laughs> in front of me. Uh, but really, the, I think the most satisfying is when somebody uh, takes responsibility for their action, but then they are able to get help 
uh, for the underlying, what the, it, what's causing the underlying issue, and be able uh, then uh, to not be back in the criminal justice system. So that's just for my job part, but what I really love the most about my job is it does give me an opportunity to come into the schools, uh, to come out into the community and be a part and, and bring greater change. And I was just thinking while we were all talking, we haven't met each other and, and so uh, we started talking and we're, we're instantly kind of networking amongst ourselves like, oh, you want to do law day? Oh, I've, I've, we're dying to do law day at the, you know, at the court. Can we talk to each other? And so I think just um, the leadership classes uh, that the mayor was talking about, I'm, I'm just thinking about being in high school. I did uh, student council, you know, you have DECA, you have, you have all of those um, uh, clubs, right? And that's where you begin to learn how to network, how to meet people, how kind of systems basically work. And so I would, I would kind of just going off of this question, but what I would suggest or recommend is get involved in something that you are passionate about. And then that's where you will learn the skills of really even being able to walk into a room and feel comfortable, right? A lot of people have a hard time just feeling comfortable public speaking or making those connections of people that you don't know or you don't like. You have to kind of walk in cold to a room. And that's where you learn those skills is by getting into a program that you really enjoy. It, it be that your your church or like I said, DECA or anything like that. Um, even your if your sports, your track, anything. So that would be my you know, if you're thinking, how did they do this? What are they? How did they? How do they make these uh, network ha happen, etc.? That's how. That's how you begin. And I remember thinking, I look back and I think student council. Uh, I heard you state PTA. I learned so much on the PTA uh, about budgets and, uh, and legislation. And it, so, just uh, think of those kind of outside networks as well. Can I just add something to yes. that? Um, <clears throat> I learned a lot of my skills through my Saturday job. I used to work at a department store for <laughs> eight years every Saturday and this was a busy street in London called Oxford Street there was a, um, a reputable department store it's full of amazing department stores but I I started working there during uh, just before university and I worked there throughout university throughout law school and I started on a shop floor selling handbags and you know jewelry and I'd put away stuff so I could buy it. So I really didn't have any money left when I had my <laughs> paycheck. Um, but you would come across people from all walks of lives and, and all, all um, mannerisms, you know, the way they would treat people. And you learn people skills just by talking to people. So no matter what you do in your job, in your you know, class, in your clubs, you are learning people skills all the time. And then I eventually had a promotion, I guess, where I was training other people like me to, you know, to go onto the shop floor. And I realized that that was my moment to think about all of these 12 people in front of me as my jury. So in my mind, that was practicing being a lawyer. And I realized in hindsight that I had all of these opportunities. And without realizing, I actually did make the most of them. Because these skills don't develop in one day. You, don't, you go to law school or come out of some you know, professional course, you're not going to learn that skill immediately. And whatever the profession is, just like the mayor said, just like the judge said, people skills are going to be the ultimately important skill that you will need. Thank you. And, and that is very true. I mean, you, you're all in this environment where you're going to class. You meet different classmates, your teachers. There's always opportunities to connect and network, right? Okay, so next question um, is for let's see, Mayor Bernie. Sure. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to face <laughs> in, this in your position? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, um, I took office of mayor in January of 2020. You may recall something very large happened <laughs> that year. Um, so I, um, you know, new mayor, two months into my job, get a call in the middle, you know, middle of the night um, that said, hey, you know, this virus we've been tracking um, from China, we knew that there was a high possibility it could come to our area. 
because of all of the work travel that we have here. And um, we had a few concerns earlier on. Um, by the way, we have confirmed a case at Life Care Center and um, oh, this is, that, was, that was a lot. Um, and about, um, I think about 14 of our firefighters, paramedics, um, have been exposed. We're not really certain what we're dealing with, but we're going to put them in quarantine at one of our stations. We're gonna shut that station down. Um, and we're gonna be meeting tomorrow at, at City Hall to start um, emergency management and kind of figure out where we need to go from here. So I kind of started out, um, there are weird things that happened that year prior to that. Um, there's a big snowstorm, there's all kinds of strange things, but um, you know, that was definitely um, one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with, um, not just in my professional life, but in my personal life. I know all of your lives have been um, <laughs> really changed dramatically because of COVID. Um, so we were, uh, um, our city in Kirkland were on the front lines of that. And um, we, um, we, you know, we used the best skills that we had at the time to deal with it. March 12th, we shut City Hall down. I remember um, meeting with my other mayor friends throughout the region and saying, you're gonna need to shut your cities down. And they were like, what, well, I don't, you know, it was still truly on, I think a lot of us were in a lot of denial about what it would be. Um, so dealing with that um, for the last few years has probably been definitely the largest challenge of my life. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think that you probably re saw this too when you were dealing with this, you, you guys were like in eighth grade, right? Or so, eighth or middle school. And you probably saw some of the most amazing things out of people during that time. And then you also saw people maybe not behaving the best as well. And so I think that's one of the things that happens in a stressful situation, really challenge, big challenges. You, see the, you can see the best in people and that's what we're really focused on. So that was the biggest challenge I had. Have had, a, had other really interesting challenges since then, but I think that just, um, was the largest thing. Now, you know, our challenge is how do we come out of this? How do we recover as a community? How do we bring things back to in person, which is lovely to see all you <laughs> face to face? Yes. Um, how do we make things like this happen? And how do we learn from the challenges that we had? How do we take those lessons, good or bad, and learn from them and um, do better as a society? So that's, yeah, that was a Thank loaded you. one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It> was, yes. <laughs> And um, yeah, uh, uh, it's amazing just to see that you're able to step into the role and just take the whole city on in with all these new challenges. That was really I, I don't. Something. There's something <laughs> I, I'm a non-panic kind of person. Mm -hmm. Like I I can have weird you know like really challenging things happen. Mm -hmm. I do I never panic. I always stay very calm and organized and make sure people do what they do. And then you know later I'll have like my moment, but. Um, when I was getting sworn in for office, this is a little premonition, one of my friends said to my sister, we're so glad that Angela's going to be mayor because if there is an emergency, if there is a crisis, she can handle it. <laughs> and my sister looked at my friend and was like, why did she say that to me? That was so strange. And then, hmm, yes, it turns out that's true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next question of, let's see. For Judge Gunson, what was the most important thing you got out of high school that has helped you now? I think I, I, I think I touched upon this, and that was really uh, being very involved in student council mm -hmm. uh, and uh, learning. Uh, like I said, how clubs are ran, Robert's mm -hmm. rules, mm -hmm. how a meeting is ran, uh, getting things done. Right, wanting to make a change, and how do you make a change, and how is your voice heard? Uh, I also was very active in sports as well, mm -hmm. and um, I was the community involvement chair for student council. So we did a where we cleaned up, you know, tr like trash in our community, and I had to help put that event on. And it's just I think those skills that helped me um, kind of learn really. How the, how the world works. It, and it seems like it would be so hard for that, to, you know, to learn that, but it isn't. And I was just talking to some students before we started that there's a Redmond Youth Court, if you're interested in the law, if you're interested in the court, it's a student-run uh, uh, organization where if you get a traffic ticket, also if you get a traffic ticket, <laughs> make sure you go to Redmond Youth Court uh, so you can get it off your record. But you also learn. You also, you know, that it's there so you can uh, learn uh, that it's very important, you know, the privilege of driving, et cetera. So I do, I recommend if you are interested in the law, 
uh, please look at Redmond Youth Court. I think that you would really enjoy that program. They also have uh, the YMCA mock trial program. I just uh, was uh, down in Olympia for the um, for the finals, and it was uh, Skyline actually. Uh, was second place but they are also some of their students are in the redmond youth court as well mm -hmm. and so i think that would uh if you're looking for something like that i really highly highly recommend it but i think in high school that was probably the best and i think just like the mayor said just i uh, am um, talking with the uh, being able to talk to your teachers and get involved and uh, that emotional intelligence is almost sometimes i think more important than um uh, how smart you are, quite frankly. So um, that's what I would recommend. Get involved. Thank you. You're welcome. And Ms. Watson, similar question. Mm -hmm. What were your favorite classes in high school and which ones do you think were most useful and helped you prepare for your career? Um, well, because my schooling was so everywhere and anywhere, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I learned from being a student. When I was a student, I was very studious, and my sister's here, so she'll confirm. I was a bookworm. I just didn't know what was going on in the world. <laughs> um, uh, but when I moved to London, the, the, the way you study, it's very different, and I didn't learn the critical thinking skills. I was very much relying on memorization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I went to university, it was during that time where I really learned, you know, what I needed to do, and it was almost towards the end. But at that time, I fell in love with uh, property law, and I loved the academic nature of property law. And in the UK, you can do internships, uh, and they're called pupillages, mini pupillages, and you basically shadow trial lawyers who are barristers in the UK. And you can do this at law firms. So at my university, you could do internships twice in, in your degree program, once in your second year, once in your third year. And I thought, I loved property law. I'm just going to go and do this as an internship. And I realized in practice, I just didn't, it didn't connect to me. You know, I didn't want to just keep renewing leases. That didn't make <laughs> any sense to me. You know, I didn't want to negotiate about how much the rent is going to increase. That's what the uh, practical uh, Im you know, application of it is for that transactional lawyer. So I had already said I'm not going to do that. But when I did a mini pupillage, I realized that trial lawyers dealing with a very different thing, and they're dealing with the boundary issues of, you know, where is the fence and how do you apply the law to litigate that? And I thought, oh, that's why I like property law. So you could like something on paper you may mm. not like the application of it mm -hmm. in practice. Mm -hmm. So you have to start with what you're interested in, but you have to go and get those practical experiences. Otherwise, you won't know what you feel passionate about. Thank you. <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I do want to make sure that you all have uh, enough time. So I'm going to just open the floor now to our audience. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and address the speaker that you have a question for. Can you say your name, too, and what grade you're in? Nihar Kadarba, I go by Nihar. Um, my question is actually for all of you. So you guys are all women who've had a lot of success, you've achieved a lot with your career, but do you feel like being a woman ever undermined your credibility, and have you experienced sexism in your field? I can, I will start, and I am certain you, you both have <laughs> examples. Um, so when I first became an elected official, um, we have, in fact I have one tonight, um, an organization called Sound Cities Association, which is all the cities outside of Seattle, and we have networking events where we get to come together, like tonight, um, Executive Dale Constantine's talking to us, it's great, get to meet people from all over the region, and when I first went there, my very first time, a gentleman who was a council member from some other city looked at me and said, oh, who do you work for? So he assumed, even though I had a that said council member and all of that, he just assumed that I clearly could not be an elected official. I must be someone's staff member that just came to this thing. So that was like the most, uh, and I will share with you, Sarah, share with my daughters, I thought we were all over this. I thought this was long gone, but apparently it's not. So um, yep, that was just a few years ago. 
You know, this happened to me last week. You know, it depends on the people you're working with. Um, even if people come to me, I'm a, I'm a practitioner, I practice law, so people come to me for services. And uh, just uh, last week or the week before, somebody came to me and this person said, I did all the research and I can do, you know, ABC. And I kept saying, you need to do X, Y, Z. And he wasn't necessarily responding to what I was trying to say. And what I realized, you know, as I was speaking, he was already talking down mm -hmm. to me and mansplaining as a word that I have to deal with sometimes but what what is so important is that you as young women particularly you have to hold your ground and know that what you're saying is the right thing and you don't have to work with everybody it took a long time for me to realize that I could say no no matter what the issue is no is a full sentence it, uh, and you will learn this as you go, but you have to practice it. Um, so I'd say on a daily basis, I see some form of it, but I, it, it doesn't hold me back anymore. It took a long time, but that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm gonna go uh, way back. So when I was, uh, after undergrad, uh, before going to law school, I decided I love to travel. And so I thought, how can I do that? And so I was a flight attendant for two years, and I was studying for the bar. So, excuse me, I was studying to take the uh, law school entrance exam, the LSAT. And so I would study, I would take the night flights so I could study uh, while everybody was sleeping on the airplane. And so I had a lot of pilots that uh, would ask me what I was doing, male pilots, and I'd say, oh, I'm studying for the LSAT. And I would say 97% of them just looked at me like, good luck. I mean, it was so, it was so degrading. Mm. Um, but there was a couple that were so excited and would ask me how I was doing if, you know, I had gotten my thing up. Blah, blah, blah. So I think, you know, just like you can't let somebody bring you down. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I knew exactly where I was going. And I also had a very strong mother who unfortunately had lived kind of through that madman era. And so anytime she saw any of that, you know, she immediately let me know that. And so if you don't live in an environment like that either, you're not, I think, aware of how it can constantly make you feel like you can't achieve something. And I do hope that we have fought for so many years. It's going to be here for a lot longer as well, but it's a lot better. But don't let anybody make you feel less because you're a woman. You. You're welcome. Yes, go ahead. I'm Ella Leslie. Um, I was just wondering, like, as women, you know, you both, or sorry, I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, do you guys feel you get enough support from your family as you all have very stressful I'll start. I my husband is amazing. I don't. I think I picked the right husband that allows me to do what I need to do because, you know, I as you know, I was appointed and I've also been elected, and that takes so much time out of your daily life. So, for instance, when I got appointed to Bothell, it was probably six weeks where I didn't see my family. I was talking to people, <laughs> writing letters, networking, and I had to have a very, I think my, you know, I'm so thankful that my husband is so strong and actually carried our household, basically, and let me do that. And so I think having the right partner uh, is, is very, very helpful. So I, I'm thankful for him. And I'm just as fortunate as judge I'm very lucky to have an amazing husband too um, when I started practicing immigration law I had a, I'm gonna tell you two stories um, when I started practicing immigration law, I was practicing with somebody else and later I learned how not to practice from this person but I didn't know <laughs> what my <laughs> what my next step was gonna be and my husband said you know just go out there and if you fail it's okay I'll still love you and that gave me the confidence and the strength to start my own law firm, Watson Immigration Law, and I haven't looked back. And it was his encouragement that made me be able to do that. But throughout this time, after our sleepless in Seattle moment, we've got two children. One is 13 and the other is 10. And at this age, you know, there's Girl Scouts and this <laughs> event and that extracurricular. 
one cannot do it without the support of the family. And just tonight, I'm going to take a red eye to get a conference. I'm going to be speaking out on Friday. I've got the kids doing a million different things. And he's picking up all my slack. <laughs> and so um, it is so important to find the right partner who understands you, your goals, and you are truly living in partnership for each other. And, and I will just say all of that, and also um, I think that um, it's important to have not just your family support, but your close friends support as well. Um, sometimes, um, you know, the the burden of being in a in a strong leadership role like this can can take its toll, and so it's important to know like who your who your who your real friends are, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and who can support you in different situations. Um, I'm very fortunate. My family is very supportive. And, you know, honestly, they said yes before we really all knew what we were getting into, <laughs> which sometimes is the best way to go. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful that I get to be a strong role, role model for my daughters and other, um, other people, other um, young people in our city, in our region. Um, I'm fortunate my husband's extremely supportive and learned how to cook because, by the way, we weren't eating very well <laughs> in first time. So he picked up the slack, um, can do all that still. Um, and uh, just really fortunate to have really good friends who get, get me and get, get the importance of this role. And um, yeah, it's good to have supportive people around you. And I think it's important to realize when you have, you guys are in a really interesting age where um, you have, you know, you have really good friends and you have friends who are probably struggling in a competitive nature with what you're doing or what they're choosing and all of that. And sometimes it's okay to just say, hey, I need people who are really supportive around me right now. And I, I think you're a great friend, but um, I'm not really trying to compete with you right now. I'm trying to do my own thing because I think I know Redmond High. You guys are really competitive. So try to keep that in mind too. It's okay to compete, but also support each other. Um, there was a quote from, was it Madeline Albright? And it's a, also a female quote, but it said, you know, uh, the, the short version is um, you need to be supportive of your women friends doing mm -hmm. their things because mm -hmm. you should not mm -hmm. let them. And mm -hmm. It's a, there's, it swears in there, I'm not going to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Madeline Albright and supportive women and you'll, you'll catch the quote. But it's, it's really important to have It's a great quote. quote. I know, I, I wish I knew it because I know exactly what you're talking about. It is a great quote. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but for, for, the, for the young men here as well, have people around you that are supportive. Mm -hmm. Have friends that will tell you yes and also tell you no. Um, have people around you who are there for you um, and, and support your dreams. Mm -hmm. um, yes. This question is kind of similar to the, um, what your most meaningful experience in high school was, but uh, what would you say your most meaningful experience in like, your undergrad was that helped you prepare for um, grad school? Because I'm in leadership right now and I'd love to do that in college, but mm -hmm. I'm looking at like, a bigger school and I recognize it probably pretty difficult to be elected then? Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's almost as difficult as you make it to be, too. Yeah. Um, I would say, um, well, one, sometimes it's good to try something and fail, um, because it's the trying part that helps you grow, no matter what the result is. So don't, don't limit yourself um, at this point when you're thinking about that. Um, in college, um, um, probably the most impactful thing for me was when I actually transferred schools because I was so excited to go to University of Washington. Woohoo! you know, go Huskies. And then I realized I was in a school of 40,000 people. I came from a graduating class of 200 people where I knew everybody. Um, I was lost, lost, lost. Um, and so I had to be okay with transferring to a different school, doing a different program, doing a, taking a different track. And to be honest, it ended up being a fantastic experience. Um, getting a biology degree there was wonderful because I knew all my professors. I could chat with them. Uh, sometimes a smaller school or a different situation is can be a really great place to be, um, and um, I wouldn't trade it for, for anything. But um, so I, for me, that making those decisions and realizing my my limits and my what helps me, you know, grow the most was making a change, and it was I had to be okay with that, and it was it was it ended up being like one of the best decisions I ever made. So sometimes the hard things are good. I'll just say, um, my college experience, I wish I would have pivoted. Like um, the mayor said, she pivoted. I, my college experience, I did not like whatsoever. Most people love college, right? It's their favorite time. Uh, but my parents had, were going through a divorce, and I had to go to a college that I didn't know I was going to have to go to. Um, and 
I lost a lot of confidence. I was very lonely. I it was it really was um, a difficult time, and um, I will say fit is so important. And just like you know, I think the mayor is saying is like, okay, you dub, yeah, this is where I want to be. And then you get there and you're like, well, I don't fit here. And so if there's anything that I can teach my son is when you don't fit pivot get out and go find somewhere that you do fit now when you're in high school or you know elementary you have to be where you are but when you um, graduate you can determine where you want to be now for me I didn't I didn't pivot like you did and I, I wish I would have but I uh, and I but then I went to a law school that I really loved and then I realized that how important fit is so um, I think remember that but what I like for you to think of is if you do go into a big school and you're like wait but it's there's so many people and how are they gonna how am I gonna succeed in you know in this big pond uh, just do it don't be don't be nervous about it just do it and you might not you might not be the president you might not be the vice president but it's going to teach you something and you might be <laughs> what do you think oh you know I don't know if I can uh, add much to that my experience is so different because of the uh, life cycle I've gone through um, but when I went to university I, I found myself so to speak because I had gone through these transitions and university helped me blossom you know I was finally outside of my house and I was meeting new people and um, you know the critical thinking part I was just learning that still um, I was I was learning the way of life because of all the things I had and I I had some amazing friends and basically I grew up a university and it was the beginning of learning that I can really make a difference even as a student lawyer mm. and I did a lot of things during that time as well as my law school days of pro bono work and really set the path for where I am today but I think you know I, I echo what the mayor and the judge said you just try to try to make the most of it you know don't put pressure on yourself see it as fun this is this mm. is a time in your life that will not come back again it's very hard to understand that and realize that because you're so eager to get to the next step mm -hmm. But enjoy it. Be the student that you are. Enjoy the, all the things and the perks that students, being a student, gets you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That was um, yeah, really echo what they all said. Um, you know, it's this matter of finding the best fit for you. That is so important uh, because if it's not, you'll be just struggling in that environment. Whereas you could be thriving if it's the best fit. So yeah, just really take the time to explore while you and come. I will see also me share yeah. that I know mm -hmm. a young man. He's 27 now, but he was ASU Dub president, and he mm -hmm. comes from Redmond. And so, you know, I would say that, you know, did he did he think that when he was younger? I have no idea, but I would say don't don't uh, don't put limits on yourself just based on um, fears. Necessarily, you know, the, someone someone's got to be president, yeah. right? <laughs> someone's got to do that. I, I mean, I I didn't think I'd be mayor, but someone someone needs to be mayor, right? Yeah. So, you know, why not you? Why not? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Try to be have that confidence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, both. <laughs> I don't know. You're, no, no. Go ahead. Two hands. Two hands. All right. Go. We all really like plan our futures too far in advance. I think sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how do you? How did you all like handle pretty significant <laughs> career changes? I'll start. I think I think you have to have a goal. There's no question because you have to have a journey towards a destiny. What you need to have is flexibility because of the twists and turns that will come along. That you cannot predict. They're outside of your control. You just have to go with the flow sometimes. So I think what you've heard here is that everybody's had twists and turns and they've successfully nav navigated all of these things to get to whatever that is. Right now it's mayor, it could be, you know, who knows, there's other, other things to do, <laughs> you know. Um, but you just make sure that you have a goal and these are there are little steps getting there and stay, stay open to whatever comes your way. 
I think follow your passion too. I'll just give an example. I was a prosecutor uh, and uh, you wanted to make it to felonies, right? We did district court, the DUIs, the assaults, but you want to get to the murder trials, right? And, um, but I was very passionate about domestic violence, helping domestic violence victims. And so there was an opportunity to start a pilot program for domestic violence. And, but I had the opportunity to go to felonies. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, this is my passion and we need to do it differently, and I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna give up my opportunity to get to felonies first. And I had a lot of people tell me that they thought that was the wrong decision. And strangely enough, when the Bothell judgeship came up, they were looking for somebody that understood domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So if, even when you think it is maybe making you go backwards, if it's your passion, it will make you go forward in the right way. Maybe not that day, maybe not that year, but eventually it might. And I just always thought that was so amazing that it was like, I'm, and I'm glad that I started that program because it did help so many people. And I would say um, when I look back on my life and the, the jobs I've had, the choices I've made, um, where I am today, there was a thread that kind of tied it all together, and it was that I always wanted things to be better for others. So that has driven me my whole life. When I was teaching, I worked in a school that was 50% free and reduced lunch, which means you know the kids, a lot of the kids, very really struggled day to day. And my goal was just so that they could understand science and understand the world around them and make sure that their lives could be better. Um, and then I and I.